Thanks for being here this morning. Thank God for the ministry. Our building's large, and uh, it may not look packed out because of the size, but it pays to build for the future. I came 27 years ago, and the attendance that we had then did not exceed either one of our services. God's doing a marvelous thing. Fact of the matter, during the week, I think last uh, week in our building, we had probably well over 75 that came from off the streets and came from different areas that don't attend here on Sunday, but they come here for ministry. Fact of the matter, we even have a step study in a Methodist church elsewhere that's sponsored by this ministry. Then our campus over at uh, Upper, somewhere around, I think, 75, as an average, have been meeting. The radio broadcast every Sunday morning, the television outreach over many different stations. Live stream is a powerful, powerful thing. I'm amazed at how many watch by live stream every Sunday. And then we have the podcast. What, the, what I'm saying is there's a lot of responsibility that all of us have in coming together and making a ministry work. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks for your support with your presence and your prayers, your finances, and all that's involved. We're trailing out the summer, and I'd like to move into a series that has to do with heaven. Do you believe in heaven, Pastor? Yes, I believe in an afterlife. And as an evangelist, I preach quite a bit on the eternity of the lost, a region called a hell. But I say to you this morning as a pastor, you need to know more about heaven. And sometimes it's kind of hard to wrap our mind around the fact of heaven, but the Bible does give us some beautiful insights and especially so in the passage of Scripture that we'd like to ponder for a few moments this morning. And we'll look into that as we tour different Sundays on through the next few weeks. But in Luke chapter 23, the physician Dr. Luke wrote, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, crucifying the great Son of God, God's gift to earth, crucifying Christ. They know not what they do. And they parted his raiment, and they cast lots. And the people stood beholding. They just watched it like a spectator thing. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying he saved others. Let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Add on to that that the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters in Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now here's the scene. Jesus is being crucified and flanked on either side are two others. 
who are dying, and they're dying as criminals. One of them taunts Jesus, saying, really, if, who, if you're who you say you are, you can't save us, you can't even save yourself. He's already been taunted by the Roman soldiers. They put a mock crown on his head and a mock scepter of a reed in his hand. They gave him a cruel cross for a throne. They gave a little superscription saying in the Greek and the Latin and the Hebrew for everyone to make a mockery out of him. This is the king of the Jews. Everybody's taunting, they're laughing. And then suddenly a voice cries out on the other side, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And he cries out for mercy. He acknowledges his wrongdoing, and he actually declares, we, we deserve what we're getting, but this man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus responds to this one that's being crucified with him in the most unusual way. He says to him, I assure you that today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Think of the words of hope heard by that one that's being crucified with him when he called out for mercy. Think of what those words about paradise and you'll be with me must have meant to that man that had been taunting him. For I'm telling you, everything's happening now. The earth is beginning to vibrate. The earth is vomiting to drink the red blood of the Son of God as it drips to the ground. The sunlight goes out and it's pitch dark. And an awful earthquake is rending the rocks. Fact of the matter, if you read in Matthew, it said that many of the dead were seen coming out of the grave and walking the streets. You talk about an unusual hour. You talk about fear gripping lives and hearts. I wonder what those soldiers thought. Is that really the king of the Jews? They'd taunted him. How are they feeling? The rulers had made fun. But the promise of paradise Jesus gave to the one that cried out for mercy, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. This statement is loaded with implications. It's loaded in what we need to understand about heaven itself and what Jesus is actually talking about. And I'd like to just take a few moments and note with you a little of the concept of the afterlife. So we get a better understanding of what Jesus is saying to that man on that day. And so I want to I wanna look at three things, three implications of the statement today. Shalt thou be with me in paradise? What is Jesus actually saying? What he's actually saying is that death is a doorway. All throughout Scripture, whether it's in the Old Testament, whether it's in the New Testament, all of the scriptural narrative is a promise that death itself is not the end, but it's only the beginning. That actual life in this sphere is continued in another sphere. It's as if death, as we call it, is the closing of one chapter, but also the opening of another chapter in what we call the afterlife, our life forever with God, or everlasting life. Death itself is seen as a doorway, both by the Jewish fathers and by the elders of the early church, recognizing that we can't always comprehend it. Death itself is the doorway into that other existence. Alfred North Whitehead, he was long time a, a philosopher of mathematics at Harvard University. And he had a book called The Process in Reality. And what a lot of folk don't know about Whitehead is that he switched or he moved from being a student and a teacher of mathematics. And he moved over to teaching Christian philosophy and theology. He became very interested in, in studying the afterlife. He became interested about the spiritual existence, not only in this life, but in the life that is to come. And he raised an important question. And I think that I need to share it with you because I believe it to be very important. 
His question was this, are we human beings having a spiritual experience or are we spiritual beings having a human experience? And he believed in the latter. And what he began to understand and what he began to study and tried to propagate was that we're living in this life as we live it now is only a transition into the life with God thereafter. That death is a doorway. And we're created as spiritual beings. We, we tend to call that the soul. And there's an ongoing part of us that we intend to call the soul that tends to defy the true person that we are. And it's that part of us that continues on infinitely. And that our existence now in this human sphere will transition itself into the spiritual sphere after death. That death is but a doorway into that experience. And Jesus is implying that as he says to this man, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So what is Jesus talking about when he talks about this thing of paradise? This is where it really gets interesting. And before you imagine what he's talking about, let's define the word paradise for just a moment. Paradise means a lot of different things to different people. And when Jesus uses the word paradise here, it comes from a Greek word that literally means garden. And when we think of gardens, we think of beautiful gardens and scenery and flowers and overhanging trees and the beauty of it all and walkways through it. But it's not the garden that Jesus had in mind. Actually, what he's talking about is a Hebrew understanding of heaven in that moment. And here's how it went. First of all, may I remind you that Jesus was born to Jew. He would live his life as a Jew. He would die as a Jew. And so his understanding in the human realm as he's moving through his 33 years, his understanding was in the Hebrew. And the ancient Hebrew at the time of Jesus Believe that when you opened the door called death, you entered into paradise restored. You got to understand it from their point of view. This is what Jesus is saying to this man, a Jewish man, and to all that Jewish crowd that's gathered around. You're moving through a door from death into a paradise restored. Paradise would be restored. Now you got to go all the way back to the creation story, the story of Adam and Eve, and this is the Hebrew thought about it. Adam and Eve were in a garden, a garden of Eden, a garden of paradise, and people there would live forever. They would not die. There was no disease. There's no suffering. There's no sorrow. But then sin and unfaithfulness took place. And guess what? They were ex expelled. They were exiled from the garden. Now, human life has one universal thing in common. That is, we're all broken now. We're all selfish. We're self-absorbed. We hurt one another. We do damage and destruction in our world. While at the same time, we do some good things. We have life-enhancing things, and there's always good and evil, and it seems as though they coexist together. Hebrews believed that heaven was the restoration of the original paradise or garden. And what had been broken through the generations would be restored in God's coming paradise and God's coming kingdom. And the word garden that Jesus uses from the cross to a repentant person is the same word that is used back in that Genesis story of creation. When Adam and Eve were expelled from paradise and from the garden. So when Jesus turned to that man that day and said, today shall thou be with me in paradise, he's saying that God in heaven is going to restore the brokenness of our human existence. And God only knows how broken we are and what the struggles that we go through in life because we're so messed up. You have to, you have to spend months trying to find a counselor. You spend months trying to locate a good psychiatrist. We're so messed up and so broken as humanity in our human existence. 
Only God can bring restoration. And what he's saying to that man on the cross, your life is broken now, obviously, and you're being crucified now for the crimes that you've committed. And so he confesses his own guilt. He confesses his own wrong. And Jesus is actually giving him the promise of paradise. Not only to him, but to, to all. And he's saying that in that coming heavenly kingdom, God's going to restore the brokenness of our human existence. And that's why people from all walks of life have longed for something beyond the mortal plane. Something beyond our understanding now. And even those who profess they do not believe in any afterlife still within the human heart, they're looking and longing for something better. How many people will say, is this all there is to it? Is this the best you get in life? Is there anything else? How many have laid awake on, on their back on a star-studded night and looked up into the stars and, and uh, you wonder who we are and where did we come from and where are we going and why are we here? And the human question speaks to the desire of restoration. And the biblical concept of heaven is not that we live here and we get a redemption ticket stamped and, and then we go off to glory land. It's actually an eternal promise that God's going to restore the brokenness of our human existence. That's the kind of heaven I want to go to. This whole concept of riding on clouds and playing a harp sounds kind of boring to me. I want to be a part of the great restoration of God's heavenly kingdom. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he promised paradise to a broken, dying man on a cross. The great message of restoration. Heaven not pie in the sky by and by, but the great restoration of God and the brokenness of our human existence to be restored. And God's going to do it universally in a way that restores the brokenness of our lives. And that's why death is seen as a doorway into the everlasting presence of God, where God will one day restore the brokenness. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he looked at that man on the cross and says, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. God's going to restore your brokenness right now. And God can restore our brokenness. Death is not seen as a last gasp, but it's that great restoration that God is going to have going on in our lives. And I believe that's why we associate heaven with no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. It's the ancient Hebrew way of saying all the things that we associate with human brokenness will be restored in God's everlasting presence, restoration, paradise, he called it. What was broken in the garden will be healed and made well in that moment. But Jesus also is saying something else in this statement, that eternal life is a promise. God has made that eternal promise to us. We have the eternality about our human existence. We love to sing songs, and God inspires, and the Spirit interjects thoughts in the human mind, and people have sat down and written poems out and songs, and we sing them, and it blesses our heart. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still And he walks with me. And he talks with me. We sing songs like I'll Fly Away, and it warms the human heart. And sometimes, maybe it's taken a little bit too literally and misses the actual depth of what Jesus is saying about paradise and restoration and the promise of eternal life. But Christians down through the ages have had different ways of understanding what happens after you die? I may not be in agreement with all, but I'm not here to fight anybody. I'm just telling you where I'm at. Is that all right with you? You can take your pick and you can choose what you want, and I hope you're blessed. Some believe that after you die, there's a place that you go to called purgatory. It's the concept and it's the idea 
purgatory, that it's a place of uh, purification process. Before you go out to meet your maker and gather with all the other saints. Now there's another group of people, they do not agree with purgatory. And uh, they, they call it soul sleep, and I believe this is the Eastern Orthodox way of understanding. The early church fathers dated it all the way back to what they call soul sleep, and that people's soul would sleep much as though Jesus did in the tomb between Good Friday and Easter. And their concept is that uh, from, uh, from Easter all the way to the coming of God's great kingdom, there will be soul sleep till he awakens us out there in the grave. Another option that many believe in is what they call immediate migration. The idea that when we die, we immediately migrate into the company and the presence of God and all the saints. Their, their, their thinking is that there isn't a waiting period. There's not a purification period that you get a second chance after death. And there's not this sleeping period of sorts that there's an immediate, immediate migration into God's presence. Now, I tend to favor the immediate migration. I call it the rapture. Although I understand the comfort, the direction that it has given to some people, good people even, to believe in some of the other. But I'll tell you why I believe in immediate migration. Because of what Jesus says in this statement. He says to the man crying out for mercy, he says, Today, today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today. He doesn't say in a little while or you have to wait so long, sometime in the thereafter. He looks at this man dying on a cross in pain, along with him, and says, you'll be with me in paradise today. Today, the brokenness in your life will be restored. Today, you'll be made new. It's as if Jesus is suggesting or clearly stating to the man, you don't have to wait for it. It's not a longing anymore. It's happening now. Today, you'll be with me in the restoration of God. When we call it heaven today, a little girl was visiting her grandmother, loved to go to grandmother's house. Loved grandmother's cookies. Loved to sit on the edge of the table and help grandmother make the noodles. She had noticed at grandmother's house right next to her bed on a little stand was a carrying case. Every time she went to grandmother's house, she'd see that carrying case. She asked her folks, what's, what's in that? They said, we don't know. Ask her. So one day was the day that she was going to ask, and she said to her grandmother, Grandmother, she said, Yes, honey. I said, What's in that luggage thing, that carrying case, right beside of your bed? It's never in the closet. It's never moved. It's always right there. What's in that? Oh, she said, That's my funeral clothes. I said, At my age, it can happen. The young may die, but the old must die. And those are my funeral clothes in that carrying case. I got it all packed. Why, she said, why, why do you need funeral clothes? She said, well, listen, I don't trust my family when it comes to dressing me for the casket. I know how they are. And I've seen other people that died and I saw the clothes they had on the casket and there's not a way in the world they would have chose those clothes. It's embarrassing. And so I packed my funeral clothes, and I've got strict instructions to the mortician that I'm to be buried in those clothes right there. Now think of that. That woman literally was packing for eternity. Have you given that any thought? We're all going there. We're all going through that doorway called death. You are, I am. So I want to ask you a question. Don't take it wrong. Are you packed for eternity? I'm not talking literally like she was. I'm talking about spiritually packed for eternity. God has offered eternal life. It's offered. You can receive it. You can have it. 
But are you packed for it? What do you mean by that? I'm asking, do you have all of your men's made? Have you got all of your sorries said? Have you got all of your prayers of repentance prayed? Are you on the right road? Are you on the highway or did you take a detour to other locations and sights and sounds? Are you in the ditch? There's only one way to get there. Have you packed for heaven? We're travelers, you know. Better get it straight. Because you have a date with destiny just as I do. We need to pack. We need to pack for eternity. It's a promise today. See, for us, we have an opportunity sitting here in this sanctuary to get packed up and to get it right and to get it straight and to get forgiven and to get nothing between my soul and the Savior. We can make sure our relationships are right and that our heart is right and that we're on the faith path. And it all begins like it began for that man. He admitted he was wrong. He owned it. He cried out for mercy in that moment, and he received it. He wasn't cynical. He didn't taunt Jesus. He didn't make fun of anything that was happening. He zeroed in on his own need, and he left the rest with God. And that's our calling, isn't it? Packing. Packing for heaven. I can't pack for you. You can't pack for me. You can't pack for your neighbor. Grandmother can't pack for you. She can pray for you. It'll help. But you'll have to do your own packing. Are you packed and ready? Today is the time to start, time to begin, because God's made a promise to us. He offers eternal life today. It's time to start packing. But Jesus also said something else. He not only said that heaven is a a portal or a doorway into the afterlife in God's presence. And that eternal life is an offered promise, a guaranteed promise. But he's also saying in this statement that heaven is our ultimate goal. Heaven understood in the way that Jesus is using it about paradise. His great restoration is our ultimate goal. It's our final destination. That's what he's striving, what we should be striving for, not just living life, trying to get through the going through, but rather living this life in a way that's pleasing and honoring to God, living a life that makes a difference in people, living a life of compassion and care, living a life of confession of Christ. All those things are part of the packing and getting ready because heaven is our ultimate goal and our final destination. And that's important for us to affirm, not just to take for granted. And especially in a day and time when it seemed like we have all this rise of religiosity. Everybody creating some kind of a new religious concept. Building another little religious kingdom that keeps me in and keeps you out. And they're right and you're wrong and they're going up and you're going down. You can't say it and they can say it and on and on it goes. Everybody's got new rules. Whatever give us the right to sit down and start writing all the rules out. You already got a rule book. Who am I to keep you out when Jesus is trying to let you in? I'm just talking to you for a moment. Maybe we'd show up at some of these real need organized services that we have. And see people in the struggle just to survive every day. You begin to realize how Jesus is trying to work with the lost and the broken of our society. This man that Jesus gave the promise of paradise to was a criminal, a crook. The literal word for him was a thief. And Jesus offers him a promise on the spot. And he's not even a candidate for for heaven, not according to a lot of people's book. He can't possibly get in. In fact, he's just got to pay for his crime. So he's going to, he'll need a purgatory, won't he? But Jesus turns to him and offers this magnanimous promise, paradise, brokenness healed, estrangement fixed, and he offers it to him. And we, we need to be careful who we're letting in and who we're keeping out by the kind of folk that Jesus seems to let in and that he offers the promise to. 
And if Jesus is in charge of letting people into heaven, it's going to be interesting because he turns to this criminal, this crook, this thief, and says, today, paradise is yours. Brokenness is restored. The promise is yours. And you don't even have to wait for it. It's yours today. Today, you'll be with me, says. We're going to the same place. Who's Jesus hanging out with? Broken people. People that really needed help. And the promise is for, and we work so hard. Somebody was working so hard on it, they wrote a little poem. You want to hear it? And they signed it anonymous. I'd love to meet anonymous sometime. I've never met anonymous, but I've had anonymous say a lot of things about me. Anonymous. (laughs) I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door. Not by the beauty of it all, the lights, or the decor. But it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp. The thieves, the liars, and sinners, the alcoholics, and all that trash. There stood that kid from seventh grade. He swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor. He never said anything that was nice. Herb, who I... Always thought was rotting away in heaven, was setting pretty on a cloud. Nine was looking pretty well. I nets Jesus, what's the deal? I would love to hear your take. How did all these sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Can you give me a clue? Hush, child, Jesus said. They're all in shock. They never expected you. You want to hear one more? If you don't, I I want to share one more. (laughs) Anonymous again. I dreamt death came the other night, and heaven's door, or heaven's gate swung wide. Then angel with a halo bright ushered me inside. And there to my astonishment stood folks I judged and labeled as quite unfit, of little worth, and spiritually disabled. Indignant words rose to my lips, but never were set free, for every face showed stunned surprise. Not one expected me. What a promise Jesus gave to this man today. Shalt thou be with me in paradise? He turns to him and assured him. I want you to listen to me carefully as a pastor, as a preacher. That same promise offered to that man long, long ago is the same promise offered to you today. Doesn't matter what's your background. It doesn't matter if you're a do-batter or a do-gooder, or if you don't do anything. It's offered to all of us. How can I get this assurance? By putting your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. By owning your own sin, by making confession, recognize the same promise offered to that dying man beside Jesus is the very same promise he extends to you today. It can be yours today. And you know something? If we keep putting it off to another time and another place, we're going to miss that opportunity. Jesus Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And with all that was going on, all the hecklers, and all the booing, and all the fun making, and Christ just dying in the human body, he turns and he says, today, I'm going to restore you into my great heavenly home. You'll be with me. And his head falls on a pulseless bosom. And he gave up the ghost. I wonder how many others begin to cry out to him. I wonder if the other thief begin to say, Jesus, hey, Jesus, what about me? Jesus. But opportunity was gone. There, today was over. And the night of the soul had set in. I'm telling you as a pastor, as a preacher of the gospel, 
You need to get in while it's called today. For the night cometh when no man can get in. Father, take the little message this morning and give it all the momentum that it needed. And deposit it so deeply into the human mind that we can't walk out of here and forget it soon. This is your message, not mine. This is something that you wanted to say to our gathered audience here that you've laid on our hearts over an entire week. And so now we have a responsibility that we didn't have before. And if we would miss heaven, we can't blame anyone else. If we scream out, Jesus, Jesus, help me, and it's too late, we can't blame anyone else. While it's called today, we'll humble ourselves and call on you. You'll speak mercy and restoration to the brokenness of our life. Speak to us this morning in this gathered crowd. And those watching by live stream, those that will be seeing it by television, may it be an opportunity to arouse and awaken like an alarm clock our soul that we need to get in. May we not tell our soul to hush, but allow you to awaken our soul to the need for eternity to be restored now so we can be a part of your coming kingdom. Now lay it heavy on our hearts, write it on our minds, and follow us out of this building. And may we forever and ever be the same as when we walked in this morning, because we have heard from you what we need to do, and may we soon be doing it, I pray, in Christ's name. And I wonder with our eyes closed just for a moment, just for a moment, Is there anyone who would say, Preacher, I need to do something today about my eternal welfare. And you just get out of a seat and make your way down the aisle. We're not singing. We're giving you a moment if you want to come. And you can call out for mercy. And I believe Jesus wants to hear that cry and intercede for you with the Father. Anyone like that at all, we'll wait just a moment. Father, we thank you for this time together. Dismiss us now, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Stand together, shake hands, God bless you. Have a great, great week.